to me, it makes a lot of sense, but to other people, I have to, I have to think real hard about the way I need to sit so that it comes across in a way that they, uh, they, um, they, they, they truly get it. And that's what I'm kind of trying to do in this presentation is to put those ideas together in a way that hopefully it'll flow to you in a way that makes sense. And um, it'll come to my mind and yours, and hopefully we'll do that together. I'm, I just want to say, like I said, really excited. This is my first uh, you know, 3D printing audience, and this is a huge deal to me. Like this technology, I don't invest in it like technologies like lightly. Um, if it's like a coding language or something, something that comes out there or whatever, I, I would do a lot of research first before I invested the time, energy, effort into learning such things. So 3D printing is that thing where I'm taking a lot of time to figure out if it was a technology that was sound and was real and made sense, and I, I really think it is. So that's why I'm here, that's why I want you guys to do this. I want you guys to really get why 3D printing is so disruptive, why it's in the news all the time, why people talk about it all the time. And uh, I want you guys to have a personal attachment to it, not just this thing you see on TV or once in a while. So, further ado, this is it. And um, here we go. So, I want to start, um, I've been getting this in video editing real quick, so I just want to throw this out there. I just put together my first uh, video introduction. It's basically a little. 20 second little clip, but uh, I feel like everyone should have their own video intro, so this is just a lot. Okay. And, and rendering frames like that, you know, that's the same way. When I saw Tour Story, the first one, like the very first Tour Story, I thought that the process behind the way they made those characters move, I thought that was the most interesting thing that I could ever like, imagine. I thought maybe one day I'd have the ability to understand what they were doing and how they were rendering frame. That was one of the first videos I've ever actually been able to render out an animation that was from scratch and then start and move that process. So I hope to do some more of that, and maybe I think that if I can put together some stuff like that for 3D printing, maybe it'll catch people's attention. But a little bit about me. So um, I, you know, I've been a web developer, it's, like, it's so great to have one of my guys that I started here with, I don't want to call him out by name or anything, but he knows he is, and we got started together, um, just we had a huge love for tech, and we just love tech, and we just wanted to be a part of it, um, and we teamed up together, and basically, first actually started out as kind of a geek squad, you know, type of a place where you just, you know, person calls you up and, hey, my computer's broke, what can you do to fix it? And we kind of changed and migrated over to being web development because we knew that with web developing, we could get our foot in the door, we could talk to a client and get them to at least hear us enough to give us a chance to explain how technology was going to change their life. And me and him were really passionate about doing that. So we would use a website design thing as a way to kind of get in there, and then we would go and tell them how we wanted to change their technological world, basically. That was our real motivation. Um, I'm also a graphic artist, it's a huge passion for that, and that's probably all I'm going to say true. But the last two things in 3D printing, which is what I've spent the last year, a year and a half of my life doing, I feel like too much probably. You know, it's, it's taken away like probably a lot of time and should have went elsewhere. But you know, it, when you're starting a print, like we have one going now, which before you guys leave, I would encourage you guys to just, if you haven't seen one up close, to kind of stand right over this and kind of really get a look at what's going on on the inside. Try not to touch it. it. What's that? We try not to touch it. Yeah, we try not to touch it. It's, a, it, it's just a fascinating process. And we'll go a little bit into that about how it works on a more intricate level, but it's just a fascinating process. It really is. Um, from Tallahassee and, oh, and VR development, which is another I don't want to go too much into, but I don't know if you guys heard about virtual reality too much. Um, Facebook just bought Oculus. Uh, to company that started on Kickstarter, they just bought them for $2 million, um, but I started developing for that about a year ago, and um, it's been going well too. I actually, the reason I'm doing both of these things, and people ask me that all the time, why are you doing 3D printing and VR? Well, I think those two technologies are going to converge in ways that people haven't really even thought of yet. I've actually already started doing a couple little projects to do that, but I'll, I'll go into that a little more later, but I think that they they're complements of each other. It's like uh, ketchup and mustard. They grow together, and I think that they're going to continue to be part of the future. Um, so, what is 3D 
three grains. So I, before I go into that, I have this small little technical definition that I pulled, but I just wanted to give you guys my definition first, um, like a personal kind of definition of what I think it does. I think it turns matter into three dimensions. And I don't mean just plastic, because that's what most people think it just does, is turn plastic, which it does, but we're going to talk about a lot of the other materials that are available. But the main thing that you have to understand is that it prints in three dimensions. And what that means is, is that it prints from left to right, which is your X, it prints forward to back, which is your Y, and it prints up and down, which is your Z. And what you're doing is, is you're actually giving the computer, you're giving the machine the information on how to understand those coordinates, those X, Y, Z coordinates, and you're giving it the, the instructions on how to move over those coordinates in order to create a geometric shape, the thing that it's building. You have to know where to tell it to go over X, Y, Z. If you can do that, then you can tell this machine exactly what you want to make um, because you can just cut the little pieces up into little bites and then go from there. We'll, we'll talk more about it. Variety of materials, I get this all the time. It's one of my first most frustrating questions that people think that there's only plastic it's only plastic if this is the printer that you can afford, which is a $3,000 printer which just prints plastic and has a pretty decent build volume, which is, um, you know, okay. But yes, there's printers already right now that are not too much more expensive. We're talking 10, 20, 30, in other words, of maybe $500,000 even. They can print metal, they can print bronze, they can print gold, even aluminum, steel, you name it. Um, the, any material that you would like to print it, there's someone working on trying to figure out a way to make one of these machines print. Um, many shapes and sizes, and that's my next point, it's from beginner to commercial, mine's right there in the middle, which we, I would call this the pro server line. It's the one, you, if you want to buy right now and have a warranty, and then you take it back if something breaks, which I have broken about five pieces on this already, um, then make the is amazing. They give you a warranty and we'll say, um, if you go with one of these smaller ones up here, which are open source printers that you can build yourself right now for a sub maybe $500. And I can point you guys to some places uh, and the instructions on how to put one of those together and you can like I said, do it for sub $500. And I want, to, I want to interject something real quickly. Tomorrow night, Making Awesome is yeah. coming out and they're actually having a workshop, it's a paid workshop, on how to build your own 3D mm -hmm. printer. So you're going to do the workshop and you're going to end up with, at the end of it, with, to take home your own 3D printer. Which I highly recommend. I think mean, that, that would be, you couldn't get a better one-on-one -on -one experience with a printer than that, that workshop. Um, yeah, it's going to be each uh, weekend in August. Okay. Of four parts. So this is the technical definition. I don't want to go into it too much, but the idea of it is that basically you're teaching a machine that reads a CAD file, a design of something that you made and it actually lays down layer by layer um, material that successfully builds up the thing that we're trying to build. So the thing that we're building right now is actually a nutcracker, hopefully. I've never built it before, so I figured we'd do something together that was new. But it's going to be a nutcracker, so you actually have two pieces with a, like a bolt that you can screw in, and it's actually going to crack nut, hopefully, and hopefully it'll be done before, before we're done with it. But the thing is, what most people, it's kind of hard to kind of wrap your mind is, is that it's not giving all at once the instructions on how to make the thing. It's only having to tell it layer by layer how to make it. So it only needs to know the machine how to make that first layer and then how to make the second one and then how to make the third one. It's, it's cutting the, the entire shape up into a series of little bits that, they, that the machine can understand. Um, So the history, honestly, there's so there's, there's a lot to go through with the history. I mean, a couple of brief points. I mean, in '84, uh, the first guy, uh, Chuck um, Hull, was uh, part of 3D Systems. Is one of the first companies to really get a part of uh, 3D printing. He came up with the stereo uh, STL format, which is what nowadays is the primary format for uh, 3D printing that most you know major 3D modeling programs will use to interpret the model. Like, so if you have a baseball and that's what you're trying to build is a baseball, that file is what he came up with the design. What how, what would that file be compressed of? What would it, you know, how big would it be, et cetera, et cetera. The .stl was created in 84. Um, one thing that's kept this technology from us, and I like to just bring up as a point as part of the history, so people ask me 
all the time, but why hasn't it just appeared, you know, 10 years ago? Well, there's been a lot of patents surrounding the technology that is involved with this and the way it works. And the guys who created this 20-something years ago um, have been very close to those patents. Those expire, actually, I think this year. Um, patents last like 21 years, and those patents back from the 80s are about to expire. And that actually is why so many companies are jumping on 3D printing this year, because those patents are expiring, and the, and the key technologies that, that make this technology work are going to be open to the world. It's, it's like when Aspen was, you know, yeah, this is how it works, everybody. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's going to be an exciting year for sure. Got a quick question? Yeah, what are some of the companies that are invested heavily in 3D printing technology? Oh, wow. Um, so the company is funny, the Stratasys, which was that from like partner of the company when I was talking about, just bought BakerBot. BakerBot was the darling child, I guess you could say, of the American-made 3D printing movement that's starting to happen. Um, is BakerBot. And right when they got pretty much to the biggest point they could get, um, one of the big guys, the commercial 3D printing companies, came in and, and bought them. So, you know, a lot of the, you know, it's great that a lot of the technology is in here in America. It's like one of our, like, I feel like cornerstones we have left in this, you know, international market. You know, uh, 3D printing is pretty, pretty close to home, I think. Well, this year, like I said, is, is when all that's going to change, so it's going to be pretty disruptive here. Um, that takes us to the present, you know, public awareness. So I think we're at, like, an all-time high with the public awareness. I think um, it's really gotten to a point where, like, everybody knows that word, 3D printing, buzzword, but they don't really, like I said, understand, you know, what it, what it can do exactly. Um, beginners of the Makers movement, which I want to talk about, which is this movement that's starting with people who already own 3D printers, people like me who are printing every day, who, when I break something now, I've had a fundamental shift in the way I think about replacing that thing. I used to always think I was just going to go find the best replacement to that thing. I never thought I was just going to go to my printer and try to make it at first. Exactly. But that was the shift that happened. And, and, and now when my, you know, something on my car breaks or a door handle or a plastic clip to this, the, the under part of my, you know, piece of furniture breaks, I don't think about replacing the furniture. I think about building the part that I need to build with the printer. And that's what I mean by the maker's movement. It's literally a movement of people coming together and deciding that you know, we have as individuals the power to create now, and we need to start doing that. We need to start teaching each other how to do it. Um, and that leads me to a new perspective, customization. I, I've been just kind of like going through this on my own, but it's just, I, I can definitely feel like it's a natural thing. I, I make um, my own cell phone cases, and I've been making them for a while now, and you know, the last probably, well, they could last a long time, but the thing is I get bored with them. That's the problem. Two or three months, I'm not kidding, I have two or three months of a certain color or a certain style or something, I just get bored with it. And when I have the ability to change it, you do. When you have to go to the best buy, buy one for $30, it might not. But when you go to your printer and you're just bored one night and you want to print a design, you might. So what I mean is it, 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 the, the shift happening with perspective, I think it's going to continue to happen, where we're not buying for longevity. We're not buying so that something lasts five years. We're buying so that we can have it for a specific moment, or we can have it for a specific event, or we can have it for a specific day. Like, I'm going to this event, I want a green cell phone case to match my favorite team that's going to be playing that day. I think that's a movement that this allows that you would never even think about before because we just never had that ability to create more demand like that. So opportunities, you know, my biggest thing that I can see just right in front of me is that it's fast. You know, so the, one of the key things we're doing right now is prototyping for clients. And so if you have an idea that you want to see made, if you want to, you know, you just had that moonshot idea that you thought was cool, that you want to see if it actually was, to help a client build that. That's what I'm trying to learn as fast as I can is how to be a better 3D modeler, how to create the shapes digitally so that I can send it to that and have it print, printed physically. Um, but it's, it's, it's tremendously fast. Just to, like I said, give you a quick breakdown of this process and how much has changed. If you were a company who wanted to take a product from an idea to a uh, mock-up to presenting it at your, at your client meeting, that was a month, well, that was months 
of the iteration. I was contacting the people in China and about the, developing a mold for your, for your thing. Literally like 10,000 of plus dollars worth of commitment that you were making to have that model made. This changes all of that. This allows you to make one, not a hundred, not a thousand, just one, just one, and hold it in your hand and see, is it actually the way you thought it was going to be? My biggest, probably, epiphany about this is that most of the things that I have in my that I see on the computer screen that look cool or I think are cool, when I print it and I hold it in my hand, it's a different feeling. It's a completely different feeling. Um, it, it, it's something that's hard to even describe, but it's just a difference of holding something that you paid for, for example, like you went to the store and bought something that you've been wanting for a long time and you finally got it in your hand. That feeling of having it in your hand is different than just seeing that thing on a screen and clicking by. It's just a different feeling. And what I mean is when you make it, this is the equivalent I feel like when you make food. It just tastes better. It's just, it's just the way it is. When, when you're part of the process of creating the thing that you're going to use, it just, it just, it's just you have more attachment to it. You, know, you care about it more. You want to see it you know, develop more, et cetera. Um, so then it, it encourages or it makes it, you know, the collaboration of people who put out an idea and want to improve it. Uh, one of the things me and Ryan, Ryan gave a great speech last night on machine intelligence, we're working on his component cases for his computers, and it just can never be done. You can never collaborate and go, you know what, these are the things I don't like, these are the things I do like. And then collaborate with me to reiterate and create a best project. You see, when, when, when that's not available, when we didn't have that before, how can we do that? So the opportunities are, uh, are definitely there. But there's definitely a lot of threats. Um, there's technical hurdles, like I said, so I've literally, I mean, I've definitely got some gray hairs over this machine. Like, it, you know, just problems that shouldn't have happened, that, you know, little flaws and things that, um, you know, there was no instruction manual or explanation of why that particular thing was happening or why it failed. Um, and that to me would scare the Joe Schmo that's just looking to get into the 3D printing and not. That, that would scare him, you know. We, we need to get we need to get this better. We need to get it more every time you hit print you get something out of it at least. Um, that type of consistency before before it really is going to hit mainstream I think. Uh, the cost is still a little high. Uh, you know, these are, like I said, the prosumer ones, they cost them from like two to three grand. Um, you can get one about this size one that does uh, stuff about this size for as low as about a thousand dollars now. So they're coming down. Um, and, you know, it used to be a lot more expensive. Um, and then so consistency. Another big thing is people expect or they just think that when you hear 3D printing that every time you get print, you're going to get the same print the same way every time. And that's not true. So the consistency right now just is still where it needs to be, um, and uh, I think people are really turned off by that. One huge upside though of this is recycling. Okay, so we're working on actually, and hopefully Ryan will actually be able to help me on building our first ever machine that this right here, right now this is printing, is feeding in plastic that is on a spool. And this spool looks like this. Just looks like pulled up wire that someone, not you know, us, melted down the plastic and formed it into this plastic string. And it's a certain tolerance, you know, for how the size of it is like 1.75 millimeter. But it feeds right up this tube and right down into this nozzle. And this nozzle just basically acts like you would think like a kind of like a hot glue gun. The plastic's coming down through it and it's extremely hot in there. It's right now I think 400 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is cooking this plastic really hot. And then when it comes out of that nozzle, it is basically a liquid, and as soon as it touches the air, it starts turning to a solid almost immediately. Um, I'd say almost two to three seconds is all it takes before it goes from a liquid to a solid um, right from this right from this spool. But what that brings me to is well, why can't we recycle it? Why can't we do this on our own? We can't. So there's a machine that allows us to take, I'm thinking, you know, milk chugs, whatever, you know, whatever we get our hands on, we can say we get a school to donate the milk chugs, right? And then we mill it down, we turn it back into filling it, and then at the end of the year, we give that school 3D computers. Because we can 
go to the computer with that. You know, like, like we can build, a, we can take raw material, we can turn it into a complex thing with that. So why not use recycling as a, as a way to kind of leverage this whole movement, get people excited about it? Because you guys have this stuff, like the stuff we can use to build in this, laying in your, laying in your pocket. So pretty excited about that. And then, like I said, it's maybe So we got some applications on um, architecture, construction, production, design, automotive, everything. I mean, the list goes on and on. I can't think of a, of a, of a industry that's not have potential to be touched by 3D printing, honestly. Um, education, I'm just so excited about because basically I want to do what I'm doing now with you guys. It's a smaller classroom, more of a setting that's built for you um, to kind of, you know, not for adults so much, but it's kind of to show you the kind of stuff you guys can build so that you guys can get excited about it. And, and show you guys how that these are going to get better with, with as you guys grow up. So if you guys start now, like right now, that by the time five, ten years from now, you guys are going to be able to build amazing things, like anything you want. To build. I mean, so it, knowing about it now is just I feel like going to be huge for for, for kids. They should be kids inspired by you know, all the other fields because I can't. That was another thing. I, just by me making the commitment that I wanted to learn 3D printing, it was like me making the commitment to learn all these other things. I mean, I've done more math than I've ever wanted to do when I was in high school from 3D. I've done more, like, you know, learning about physics and, and, and engineering and just things that I, I, I thought I was passionate about already until I needed to learn it to, to actually make something. Then, then I really got into it. So I think for education, it's just, so let's get to some cool videos. So this one was a really touchy one. Um, it was actually a really good true story. This was a 21-year-old named uh, Kozima. Um, she could not breathe. She had a particular disorder that was causing her trachea to disform or something during birth. So they decided in years that at this particular time was a good time to try 3D printing um, the first ever uh, trachea for a person. And they, they were successful. I think that was I think that was 18 months ago. I think she's the, the oldest surviving person now with a, with a, with a 3D printed trachea. Uh, but the trachea is actually one of the most of several other organs in the body. It's, it's a very detailed like part. Um, it, it, it just, it's just it's unique to the individual. Um, so if they can go in there and look before they make it. And see how they need to make it, and then make the item exactly how they need to make it. it it's a combination of things. It's using all the scanning stuff that we had before, and then using that to actually build. It. So I want to see if it comes back. The technology for solid organs, for example, like the liver. What we do is we take discard livers. As you know, a lot of organs are actually discarded, not used. So we can take these liver structures, which are not going to be used, and we then put them in a washing machine-like structure that will allow the cells to be washed away. Two weeks later, you have something that looks like the liver. You can hold it like the liver, but it has no cells. It's just a skeleton of the liver. And we then can reperfuse the liver with cells preserving the blood vessel trait. So we actually perfuse first a blood vessel trait with the patient's own blood vessel cells and we then infiltrate the parenchyma with the liver cells and we now have been able just to show the creation of human liver tissue just this past month using uh, this technology. Another technology that we've used is actually that of printing. This is actually a desktop inkjet printer, but instead of using ink, we're using cells. And you can actually see here the printhead going through and printing this structure and it takes about 40 minutes to print this structure. And there's a 3D elevator that then actually goes down one layer at a time each time the printhead goes through. And then finally you're able to get that structure out. If you can pop that structure out of the printer and plant it. And this is actually a, a piece of uh, bone that I'm going to show you in this slide that was actually created with this desktop printer and implanted as you see here. That's all new bone that was implanted using uh, these techniques. So going to a specific person? Another. And a uh, piece of anatomy or tissue that's been 
damaged or missing or you made it. You can go in, you can figure out exactly how you need to build it. You can scale it to the right size and then you can print it and install it into the person now. The thing that they're having a breakthrough here is that they actually figured out how to take the tissues of their own stuff. So like they'll take tissues that's, if you need to do your heart, they'll take something that's close to your heart and the tissues will be close enough that your body will know how to do the rest. It will fill in when they inject the, you know, you name it, into the scaffolding, um, it will actually uh, accept that. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard, but um, they were also using the technique to be able to um, take uh, three scans of a person's skull yeah. from uh, like Iraq, IED victims, and be able to 3D print them a piece of exactly fit the whole that uh, it's huge. Long, but, uh, That's huge. That's huge. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's. He's right, and it's, to me, to be able to give somebody back, like, you, you know, a really good idea like, of how they were, if they're missing, I mean, to be left with that shape, that misshape most of your life, whereas we can, that's the beauty about 3D printing, too, you can extrapolate. Well, and what I mean by that is if you have a left side and you know what that left side is, well, you can take a copy of the left side and just reverse it to the right. And even if it's not perfect, you can get a pretty good <coughs> estimate of what was over there, and when you print it, it'll actually, you know, work out pretty well. But uh, all right, all right. So this one's a really not fun one. Build a house in 24 hours. Just another one I'm super excited about because architecture, I think, is going to be hugely affected by 3D printing. Um, I kind of do it now. I try to do it on a little small scale, just so that one day I can just, I just want to just take one of those little designs and just really make it big because you could. Um, it, you, you know, you, even if you're working on a miniature and it's small, it doesn't mean that one day you're not going to have a big printer to attach that little thing to. And then it, if you hit print, it, it wouldn't know any different. It, it'll, it'll print the same way. So this is China. They recently set off to break some records, and um, they did 10 houses, I think it was, in 24 hours. This really is Thank you. 